Hi, and welcome to Module 4 and Lecture 1. Last time we started discussing theory building in political science. Here we're going to focus on one particular kind of theory building, formal theory. Now the goal for all theory building, again, is to map out the process by which x influences y, by which an independent variable affects a dependent variable, or by which variation in an independent variable x causes variation in a dependent variable y. Again, the focus here is on how and why that happens. Formal theory is a very particular kind of theorizing that starts with a series of, of assumptions that are laid out mathematically um, and then uses math or formal logic to de deduce from those assumptions implications that can then be translated into hypotheses that you can test. The most commonly used set of assumptions in political science is rational uh, rational choice assumptions owing to the basically inf basic influence of economics on political science theorizing. So rational choice assumptions um, are often, people often mistake what they mean exactly. It doesn't mean everyone's sort of um, rational in a very uh, sort of strict sense and only cares about one thing and, and so on or has no emotional attachment or that. Rather, rational choice has a set of core assumptions that imply A, people have form well-behaved preferences over possible outcomes. So if I'm given a list of things I might care about, I have well-behaved preferences over those over that list. Um, so I know what sort of my favorite thing in the list is. I can compare any one of those list elements to each other. Two, I can calculate the expected outcomes from different choices. So given a series of actions I can take, I can figure out what will happen when I take those actions. And three, um, and this is the rational part really, I can maximize my expected utility, which is to say I can choose the action, I can select a choice that gives me the best outcome, that I think will give me the best outcome of all my out possible out outcomes. Right? So rational choice really means um, being able to assess a situation and pick the thing that seems best for you given available outcomes. It does not mean you only care about money. It does not mean you only you automatically get the best possible outcome for yourself. In fact, most rational choice models tend to have you not get the best outcome for you because other people are involved as well. Um, so to be clear, rational choice just means you can make that, you can solve the difficult problem. Like all models, it's not necessarily true. Um, there are many situations in which we might think that individuals could behave rationally, but just can't or don't based on limitations to their attention or ability to, or cognition, right? So a common example of this is the difference between, say, tic-tac-toe and chess. Tic-tac-toe, you can sit down and reason through what would happen in all cases, and in general, if you're careful about it, you won't lose. And if both players are careful, you'll, you'll tie a lot. Um, in contrast, chess, even the smartest people and, and, and the most advanced computers can't solve the entire game forward, even though the game is theoretically solvable, such that you could, in theory, produce an optimal outcome. No one has that level of cognition yet to actually do that. So even, but that said, even though in the real world, everyone doesn't have perfect rationality, political scientists often use rational choice as a basis for understanding strategic behavior because it gives us a starting point to understand how individuals might respond to each other's motivations. But that sort of doesn't answer the question of why do this in the first place, right? The real reason for formalizing this stuff, whether you use rational choice assumptions or some other kind of assumptions on individual behavior, is that it forces you to make your assumptions explicit. Okay. Um, I've written op-eds. It's very difficult to try to make a coherent argument in a small number of words um, without making leaps in logic, without with, without making jumps without n not specifying assu hidden assumptions that might drive results. When you theorize formally, what you're doing is you're laying out explicitly, f formally, mathematically, a series of assumptions on behavior. Going back to the rational choice assumptions, you might lay out what people's preferences are and what they care most about so that you can figure out how they get the best outcome for themselves then you would also assume that they could do that problem. They could solve the problem of getting the best outcome for themselves, given what everyone else is doing at the same time. Um, so laying out these assumptions formally helps prevent your argument being driven by hidden assumptions that are not agreed across you and the reader of your work. Right? That's one really important thing. And I guarantee if you go now and look at op-eds, 
with that in mind, you see hidden assumptions that they all use that they hope will be agreed upon by the reader, and therefore their argument will be taken um, more strongly by the reader, but yet the reader might not agree if the reader actually saw the assumption laid out clearly. Since our goal as scientists is to make clear argumentation and to derive testable hypotheses that might be falsified, we have no interest really in trying to fool people effectively into believing what we want um, them to, to believe. That's a little harsh. Um, maybe a nicer way of saying that is we have no, we don't, we should not have an interest in necessarily convincing people of our argument um, by words alone. We want to, we want to give them the tools they need to assess it as deeply as possible, and then believe it or not, based on those um, full, that full information, that full knowledge of our argument. Laying out assumptions explicitly helps with that. It also helps us establish the impl that implications followed directly from our assumptions. Again, it is very difficult just using words to make sure you do not take leaps in logic when speaking. We all do this as human beings when we're talking to each other. We jump from thing to thing and don't lay out all the interim steps. Oftentimes that is fine, right? Certainly we don't want to have our conversations devolve into, and then A implies B, and then B implies C for like hours and end. That'd be very boring. However, we're trying to make important arguments about, say, what policies are good. It is very important not to just jump from point A to point C without the interim step point B because it might be the case that you got that wrong, right? That your jump was not justified, that it didn't follow from, from reality. It didn't follow from a real B that exists. It just followed from a B that you thought in your head might exist, right? By for theorizing formally, what we're doing is forcing us to go through step by step and make sure every step in our logic is correct given our assumptions. We can't therefore have jumps that aren't justified because all the jumps, all of our steps follow directly from our assumptions. So ideally, a good formal theory could be given to someone else who could read it then and say, oh, well, I agree with your assumptions and therefore I must agree with your conclusions. Or con in contrast, I don't agree with your assumptions, therefore I understand why I don't agree with your conclusions. Right? That kind of clarity is really helpful for, for, for making um, argumentation that many people can, can, can follow and either build upon or dispute in a clear, productive way that doesn't devolve into, into that person said this, this person said that, I don't know what to believe, well, I already agree with person, the first person anyway, so I'm going to stick with that person. Right? That's really easy to do when you don't have clear argumentation because you have to rely then upon prior beliefs and any biases you have. So we're going to just finish this brief one by talking about um, an application of, of formal theory, a very common one that actually was called at the time the paradox that ate rational choice, even though it's not really a paradox. Um, the idea here is um, why vote, right? Why turn out to vote? That may seem silly, and some people do think it's silly, but bear with me here because it's, it's a useful, to, it's a useful um, framework to understand the rational choice in this context. So the idea is simple. If you as an individual are asked should you vote or not, right? You're making some decision internally about what's important to you and what you value. And rational choice would say you should make the decision to optimize your preferences, right? To get the best outcome that you can get given your preferences and given the behavior of others. So let's think about the costs and benefits of voting, right? What are the costs? Well, you have to go register to vote, which some places make extremely difficult for various reasons um, that aren't always ready or usually or ever very good. Um, you have to go to the polls, which can be difficult given that the U.S. does not hold election day on a, on a vacation day, on a holiday, so it means taking off from work, which can be difficult, um, particularly when you have, when you have family to also um, deal with, um, to take care of, and you have to collect information about the elections. In some cases, that's easy. If you're, like, if you're voting on, say, the presidency, you have a lot of that information already. But I can tell you from living in California for a bunch of years, um, when you get a pack, when you when you get a, um, I didn't vote in California, but um, you get a packet of of potential um, uh, ballot measures, and they're very complex, and the information necessary to to allow you to make an informed decision is very difficult and time consuming to collect. So these are all costs of voting that may, might lead you to vote less often than you might otherwise. Um, want to. But what are the benefits? Um, well, one benefit 
is, in theory, that you influence government options, right? You have some say over the government. That's sort of, in, in a sense, the es an essence of democracy, as we discussed last time. You might also feel personal satisfaction about doing your civic duty, right? Voting is important. The act of voting has a lot of meaning inherently, and that should also, that should also benefit to you. You might also get social benefits, which I don't list here, that when, you see yourself, when people see you vote, they think better of you. Right? Or if they see you not vote, they think worse of you. Right? These are all potential benefits of voting. We're going to focus on that first one, that you actually have an influence over government policies. In a fairly silly example. Right? So here's an election between Bert and Ernie. Right? And this is an election with, with um, a certain number of people in each case. So on the left column here, we have um, a situation that happens if you don't vote. And the right situation is a situation which you do vote. Let's assume you're an Ernie supporter here. Um, so you want Ernie to win. You're happy when Ernie gets elected. So on the left, right, in the first row, Bert gets five votes, Ernie gets three. If you don't vote, the winner is Bert. If you do vote, the winner is still Bert. So your vote didn't have an actual effect. In political science terms, we say you're not pivotal, right? Your vote didn't change the election itself. In the second case, right, for a three, Bert wins if you don't vote, but it's a tie if you do vote. Now, say the tie was was was, was um, settled by a coin flip, you've taken the vote from a loss to your preferences to a tie, to a half chance of getting what you want, right? That's an improvement. So now you have some, some concrete benefit to your voting in terms of the outcome of the election itself. Now, in the third row, it was a tie, 4-4, but when you vote, you secure the win for Ernie, right? That's, again, good. You went from having a sort of a half chance of getting what you wanted to definitely getting what you wanted, right? And that could also be a concrete benefit. But finally, in the last two rows, Ernie was going to win anyway. Maybe you're adding the vote to Ernie's um, camp made people happier with the win or maybe felt that it was more legitimate or whatever. But in terms of the basic logic of increasing your chance of getting what you want in terms of in terms of the electoral outcome, it didn't change very much. Ernie win before, Ernie wins now. So it doesn't really change very much. That's a silly example, um, but it can be generalized to larger populations. Um, when you have a large electorate, you are very, very, very unlikely to be pivotal. It is not impossible, but it is in a population of millions that your particular vote is the difference between a tie and a loss the chance of that is small. That said, in a very big election, it's easy to get information often, comparatively speaking. If you have a very small electorate, right, like a local school board election, maybe um, you have a very high chance of being pivotal, in which case you have, a, you have much more of a, a benefit if your benefit is viewed as the increase in chance, increase in probability that your candidate wins. That said, information is also harder to obtain in a small election, potentially. Um, these are questionable, um, the second bullet points. The point of this, though, is it might be rational to abstain, right? If your vote is not going to, it's going to be unlikely to influence the election, and you only wanted to vote in the first place because you wanted to influence the election, then it might very often be rational not to vote, right? Um, so how do we get around that, right? And that was the so-called paradox, the rational choice. The idea was if everyone's rational, then no one would vote, but we have people voting. And if no one votes, um, then everyone's pivotal because the first person who votes will determine the whole election, right? So it becomes a, a problem to think through. Now in practice, right, that's just one thing you might care about, right? We can focus on the duty to vote, and that's the easiest way around this whole problem is to say, well, that's fine and all, but I don't just care about how um, individuals, what my improved chance of winning might be from my voting, I care about actually voting. I care about the act of going to vote as meaning to me. That's fine. That's perfectly um, reasonable to include in rational choice explanations. And if you include that, you can get lots of people voting based on their own preference to vote. Um, you can include social pressure as well, which also seems to be empirically a spur of people to vote. Um, or many other possible explanations. We can also create what would be called boundedly rational explanations or theories of why people vote that involve individuals not rationally or optimizing their outcomes based on their preferences, but instead just kind of doing things like, I voted in the past, I'll continue to vote in the future. That's what I do. 
Um, so these kind of things can also exist as theories. But regardless of how you decide to theorize, the importance is to lay clearly out your assumptions and the argumentation that leads you from those assumptions to your conclusions. And that's the real benefit of formal theory is it helps you do that clearly um, and in a replicable, repeatable fashion so that people can understand your argument, follow the steps, and point out where they agree or disagree with you without resorting to just sort of name-calling or back-and-forths that don't really resolve ever. Thank you.